Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Evanston History Center's pre-Halloween event. I'm Eden Jaron Perlman, Executive Director of the History Center, and once again tonight, we have people joining us from coast to coast. Welcome to everyone, and thank you for your support of the History Center. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to just let you know about a very special program we have this Saturday. I hope that you will be able to join us for the dedication of the historic marker in honor of Catherine Waugh McCullough. This is actually the dedication of the marker for the National Votes, Votes for Women Trail. Um, this is a markers across the country. Um, and we'll have one in Evanston at the Catherine Waugh McCullough Park at 1700 Livingston. That takes place Saturday at 11 a.m. and you can definitely get more information on our website. We are all in for a really fun, scary event this evening. Joining us from Wolfsville, Nova Scotia is Dean Job. Dean is an award-winning journalist and professor at the University of King's College in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where he teaches in the Master of Fine Arts creative nonfiction program. His latest book, The Case of the Murderous Dr. Cream, The Hunt for a Victorian Era Serial Killer, published by Algonquin Books, is long listed for the American Library Association's 2022 Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction. It's also a finalist as the Chicago Writers Association Nonfiction Book of the Year. The book is making the bestseller lists across the country and is, and it, excuse me, in its starred review, Publisher Weekly called it a true crime masterpiece that will easily sit alongside Devil in the White City. Dean is the author of eight previous books, including The Jazz A's Age Con Man Tale, Emperor of Deception, Empire of Deception, which the New York Times book review called Intoxicating and Impressively Researched. You may recall back in January of this year, Dean gave a riveting presentation about Empire of Deception and its Evanston connections. We're so happy to welcome Dean back for another virtual event. Dean's work appears in Crime Reads, The Irish Times, and the Washington Independent Review of Books. And he writes a monthly true crime column, Stranger Than Fiction, for Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. <clears throat> Excuse me, before handing it over to Dean, I'd like to let everyone know that we will post a link to the case of the murderous Dr. Cream, which is available for purchase at Evanston's own Bookends and Beginnings. You can order signed copies online to ship to you directly, or if you're local for curbside pickup. Many thanks to Bookends and Beginnings for partnering with us on this event. We will also po post links to the History Center's membership page and donation pages. We thank all our members for their support and we encourage you, if you're able, to become an annual member. Not only will you support programs like this one, but you can attend others for free. Finally, if you have questions for Dean, please feel free to use the chat feature and type your questions there. After the presentation, we'll be fielding questions for Dean and hopefully have a nice lively discussion. Again, thank you for joining us tonight, and thank you, Dean, for beaming in from Nova Scotia. Without further ado, I give you Dean Job. Well, thank you so much, Eden, and uh, thank you, Jenny, and thank um, uh, all, both of you in the center for having me back. It's great to, uh, to be here again and to bring you uh, uh, all the way from Wolfville, Nova Scotia, via the internet, to bring you another um, local story, uh, not quite so local. Uh, I have to say that Dr. Cream uh, has no connection directly to Evanston, but uh, I'm going to I'm going to uh, 
highlight tonight as I tell you a bit about his story. I'm going to highlight the uh, the very large and uh, excuse me, very important uh, Illinois and Chicago connection uh, to this story and uh, as as chronicled in the book. So we're going to do a, a what I'm going to do is I'm going to disappear behind the magic of PowerPoint because I have some images that I think will help tell the story. And uh, then I'm going to come back to uh, uh, answer questions, and I hope uh, I hope you'll put me on the spot. So uh, let me just get this to work, and it is. So I'm going. I've called my talk the Illinois Poisoner uh, because it's the connection of Chicago, Belvedere, Illinois, and the case uh, to the case of the murderous Dr. Cream. Uh, I should point out that. Uh, uh, Cream was never, ever, to my knowledge, ever referred to as the Illinois Poisoner, but you will find that uh, he certainly is linked to other places. And uh, um, so let's on with the story. Um, this is a um, this is a picture of Thomas Neal Cream in 1891. Uh, this picture, by the time this picture was taken. He had killed at least six and possibly as many as eight people. Uh, he, over his career, claimed uh, he, he claimed 10 victims at least. I think that's probably as many as he did. There is some dispute. Uh, but my research, I'm confident that uh, 10 murders can be can be laid at his feet. And uh, uh, I, I wanted to, I wanted to be as definitive as possible, um, but this is him in London, and I think it's appropriate we're talking about him this close to Halloween, um, because he is creepy. Um, people who knew him uh, said he had a, a, a his laugh was hollow. It was almost a cackle like you'd expect of a of a of a villain. Uh, he often wore a top hat and a cape, and. Uh, uh, quite sinister looking. So uh, he, he was very much the caricature or stereotype of the Victorian villain. So I'm going to start the story towards its end. And I'm going to start it in London. This is a view down Fleet Street uh, to Ludgate Circus. And in the background, just emerging from the haze behind uh, the spire is uh, the Dome of St. Paul's. Uh, actually, this King Lud pub was one that Cream uh, frequented uh, when he was in London. So in the 1890s, early 1890s, 1891, 92, he lived in this area around Waterloo Station and it was known as Lambeth. And to get your coordinates, these are the Houses of Parliament or the Palace of Westminster. This uh, almost ladder-like uh, structure is St. Thomas's Hospital uh, where he had trained uh, about a decade and a half earlier as a young doctor. So he knew this area when he got there in 1891. And here's a, a picture uh, complete with the sinister fog that we need to set the scene, I guess. And um, St. Thomas's Hospital is on this side. And uh, these are the Houses of Parliament. This is taken from the Lambeth side. So Cream shows up in 1891 and almost immediately uh, he becomes a, a frequent uh, customer of sex workers in Lambeth, and he almost immediately starts killing them. Uh, Cream poisoned almost all of his victims. Uh, of the 10 I mentioned, uh, nine were women. And in London, he preyed on prostitutes, on sex workers. And his method of killing was strychnine, uh, horrible uh, poison. Uh, inflicts a horrible death on anyone who takes a, a lethal dose. Uh, massive seizures and, and uh, convulsions uh, that uh, rack the person's body and incredible pain. And it can, take, it can take on the order of hours for someone to die of this lethal poison. He was adding this to medicine or putting it into capsules, saying it was medicine and convincing his victims to take it uh, to cure what ails you, I guess, for want of a better way of putting it. 
He even carried around a case. He picked this up when he was in North America before he went to London. It's a samples case that a traveling salesman selling drugs would have in those days. This is the actual case. Uh, Scotland Yard kept it in their, uh, their uh, uh, museum, uh, their internal museum all this time. And it, it was on display a few years ago. Um, quite chilling to think that's it. It's opened up, but it basically it's a, it's a square leather case, uh, the kind you'd see lawyers toting around. Um, so this gave him a supply of strychnine. He also bought some, even though he wasn't eligible to. Um, but since he said he was a doctor, that was good enough for the people who were selling this. As well, after he'd committed some of his murders, Cream had a habit all through his career of accusing others of his crimes. This would deflect attention, give him time to escape at times, or just muddy the waters enough that he would escape arrest. By the time he gets to England, he's refined these accusatory or blackmail letters to, uh, he accuses this gentleman of, uh, of one of his murders in anonymous letters that he uh, sends uh, demanding exorbitant sums, which, which incidentally he never collects. This just seems to be more of his way of, of uh, touting how clever he was or teasing the police. This man is a member of parliament, uh, Frederick Smith, and Cream accused him of one of the murders. Um, this woman, Mabel Russell, was estranged and divorcing Earl Russell Cream thought he'd help her by sending a letter accusing her estranged husband of one of his murders. So these letters would help link Cream to the crimes because he, he made the, the, the fatal mistake of writing some of them in his own handwriting. But through months and months of his time in uh, uh, Lambeth, uh, through two murders and these confusing trail for Scotland Yard of blackmail letters that they couldn't really figure out who was behind them. Um, he, uh, he escaped detection and was not even really on the radar of Scotland Yard. In fact, Scotland Yard was unsure if all of the victims had actually died of strychnine poisoning or if it might have been natural causes. But all of that changed in April of 1892. Uh, these two women, Alice March, Marsh and Emma Shrivel, were poisoned on the same night. They were friends, uh, roomed together. They were sex workers in Lambeth. And their double homicide really caused Scotland Yard to realize something was going on. This is the headquarters of Scotland Yard. And if you can remember that map, I showed you the Houses of Parliament directly across from Lambeth and in the area where Cream is committing his crimes, the uh, headquarters of Scotland Yard, newly opened in 1891, was beside the Palace of Westminster. So this literally is happening on the doorstep of the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police for Scotland Yard. Um, as I show in the book, I, I was able to recreate the uh, investigation um, of Cream by Scotland Yard because the, the file, uh, many, many inches thick still exists, and it's in the uh, National Archives. So I went to London to consult it and uh, was able to reconstruct uh, the missed evidence, the uh, dead ends, the wild goose chases Scotland Yard was going on, which was all very, it was, it was fascinating because if you're thinking, if you, if you know your Victorian ghouls and you're thinking of the dates, this is all happening about three and a half years after Jack the Ripper's rampage. Another serial killer targeting sex workers in London, targeting women in downtrodden area of London, eerily similar. But even then, it took Scotland Yard a long time to realize that a serial killer was at work again. And that may seem mystifying, but as I, as I found in my research and as I show in the book, this was such a new phenomenon. I mean, we, we think today that serial killers are so ubiquitous, it seems, in popular culture and also all too real um, killers. 
we seem to think they've always been with us, but this was a new phenomenon. And it was fascinating to see uh, the press, the public, and even the police struggling to get their mind around what actually the Chicago Tribune said when it did its assessment of cream. Uh, it's almost like a new kind of monster or killer who kills simply for the sake of killing. It was that, it, it was, it, it was like a sea change and you could see that uh, they were on the cusp of, of a, a sort of a modern era where the serial killer would become much more numerous. Cream is eventually uh, identified as a suspect. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna claim spoiler alert and not let you know exactly how that happens because it's, there's lots of twists and turns, but this is one uh, drawing from um, uh, an early court appearance with some of the characters and Cream looking very much like that photo I showed you in the dock at uh, Bow Street Magistrates Court in London as the, the case started. Um, Scotland Yard didn't realize that Cream had this past I alluded to, six murders before he ever came to London. Well, very few people had ever connected the dots, but there were newspapers, newsmen, editors, who did remember his earlier cases. And also to um, muddy the waters and escape his past, if you're sharp-eyed, you'll notice it says Thomas Neal at Bow, Bow Street, not Thomas Neal Cream. To hide his past and escape it, Cream simply dropped his surname and was known in London as Thomas Neal. And it took Scotland Yard weeks. I mean, they couldn't, Google had, didn't exist then, uh, even what, even the social media platform, I guess, as we know now, formerly known as Facebook, there were none of the tools that we have today. There, there were telegraphs, there were, communication had sped up, steamships had, uh, were crossing the Atlantic in record time, but um, it, it was very hard. There was no centralization of, of criminal records and things still moved at the pace of letters and uh, documents. And, uh, but once Scotland Yard realized that he had a past in, Can in Canada and the United States, they sent an inspector named Jarvis to North America to trace Cream's earlier crimes. So as they're building the case against him for four murders in London, they're also delving into his past. And if I can, if I can interject to say thank you for doing that, Scotland Jared, because it meant that not only I could find court records and news coverage of his earlier crimes, but I had Jarvis's investigation. He sent uh, many, many pages of reports almost daily uh, as he was making his discoveries. And he was talking to witnesses who knew Cream, witnesses who um, uh, had suspected cream of crimes. So it added a whole new layer to uh, uh, my research, but it also allowed me to tell the story uh, in a more, uh, uh, I think, interesting way, starting in London and then using Jarvis as the uh, um, uh, skeleton or the connecting uh, tissue to then tell the backstory in real time. And let's start there now. So I showed you what cream, you see what cream looked like in 1891. This rather dapper and uh, uh, more elegant gentleman, this is Thomas Neal Cream when he was a medical student at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. So uh, as you can see, a bit of a dandy, uh, he came from an extremely wealthy family in Quebec City. His father had made a, a fortune in the timber business, shipping timber to England. And uh, there was plenty of money to send cream to uh, the, what was then the best medical school in Canada. This is uh, Quebec City, uh, about 1850. Uh, cream, although his family, he was born in Glasgow, Scotland, and by the age of four, he had come to uh, Canada with his family. And this, this would have been the city as he knew it. This is the graduating class 
in uh, of uh, medical school in uh, McGill in 1876. And uh, you don't have to play Where's Waldo with this. I'll show you that screen right there, uh, front and center. And um, I was really interested in his medical training because that's the uh, one of the chill such a chilling aspect of his case. One of the reasons he gets away with so many crimes, and I really wanted to understand how he could kill so many times in three countries. His doctor, his medical degree often put him above suspicion, even when his patients were dying in this earlier phase of his career in North America. He seemed to be given too much of the benefit of the doubt. And we, you know, we, we see this kind of privilege uh, uh, being abused uh, in our time, it was then too. So um, one of the things he learned in medical school is what these gentlemen are doing. Actually, they're students at St. Thomas's in London. They are formulating their own medicines. That was very much a part of a doctor's training. Um, I think today doctors would understand what's in medication, but uh, they actually compounded medicine and dispensed it. So Cream knew exactly what strychnine would do because he was taught about it. And you might say, why are medical students learning about this lethal poison? Well, in trace amounts, strychnine was at the time a uh, head therapeutic value. It doesn't now, but in very trace amounts, very small amounts, it was used as a muscle stimulant. In a lethal dose, of course, it, it almost makes the, it makes the, the body uh, uh, uncontrollable muscle spasms like a runaway train, but uh, it could also be a muscle stimulant. So he knew all about strychnine and uh, he knew what a lethal dose was. And even more chillingly, he knew what it would do to his, uh, pay, to his uh, victims. So Cream um, uh, gets married very soon after he graduates in 1876. He marries a young woman in rural Quebec, uh, the daughter of a hotel keeper. And he marries her because he gets her pregnant. And then he performs an abortion that is now illegal. Or uh, it's certain, I shouldn't say that not then is now, but uh, the, at the time, uh, illegal. There was no basis for... Uh, uh, no legal basis for an abortion. And she almost died. Um, the family probably, in retrospect, or probably the decent thing to do would have been to turn him in. That would have ended his career pretty early because he could have been charged, convicted of, uh, of the abortion. Um, instead, they married, they forced him to marry their daughter. Um, one of the things I really wanted to understand and, and again talk about in the book was the, the stigma of, uh, of a, a woman being pregnant out of wedlock. And because you're going to see that's, uh, that, that becomes many of the women who seek out uh, cream because they're looking for abortions. Um, one writer at the time called it a living death. So these were women with no other options. Going to a medical professional out of desperation and looking for help. And that is uh, uh, the other women I'm about to talk about, that, that's, that was their motivation. They weren't sex workers. They were simply young women who uh, were pregnant out of wedlock. And uh, one of the really cruel and chilling aspects of the story is the way he abused that trust and the way his victims came to him. If you think of a Jack the Ripper, stalking the women of Whitechapel uh, to, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to butcher them. Uh, Cream didn't have to do that. His, his victims came to him, which, like, as I said, is uh, and just cruelly abuses their trust. So I mentioned he's forced to marry. Day after the wedding, he heads to London to St. Thomas's Hospital for uh, more training, and ultimately he gets certified uh, by the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Edinburgh, Scotland, the top licensing uh, medical body on the planet. So he knew his stuff. But the, over the course of uh, the year of his first year of his marriage, when he's an absentee husband, 
he sends medicine home to his wife and it ultimately kills her. This is her headstone. She died the next year. She was only 24 and uh, clung as this headstone shows, wife of Dr. Cream, clung to the respectability that that gave her, even though uh, her doctor later did not report this, but later admitted to Scotland Yard that he suspected Cream had been shipping poison medicine to her that she had taken. I'm confident, given the evidence, that this was his first victim. He ends up in London, Ontario, uh, uh, opens a practice, and another young woman dies. This one has come to him for an abortion. She's poisoned with chloroform, slightly different, but Cream is uh, has to admit that he's one of the last Peter person to see her alive. Her body is found behind his uh, office in London, Ontario. He testifies at the inquest and convinces no one that he's blameless, but he's never charged and skips town and uh, escapes that. So two murders can be laid at his door and either because of inefficient evidence, uh, the police weren't up to the task, um, suspicions weren't reported, he's free to kill again. And he ends up here. And this is State Street, um, 1870s, 1880s. Uh, he opens a practice in Chicago and touts his uh, Edinburgh credentials, uh, has a uh, practice on West Madison. Uh, I think it's uh, 1455 block or 1400 block of West Madison today because the numbers have changed. And um, it becomes known as, a, as an abortionist. So that he's on the radar of the police. Uh, he uh, is uh, said to have committed multiple or uh, to have performed multiple abortions. And then in the summer of 1880, uh, a woman dies and he's accused of being the doctor who botched an abortion. And uh, so this is his first crime in Illinois. Um, I uh, went to the uh, uh, daily courthouse and in their archives, in their dead storage, sure enough, I found this is the actual file, as you'll see, Thomas Cream for murder. And it included some fantastic evidence, including exhibits like this one that I talk about in the book, the midwife who had helped him and ultimately testified against him. This is the note she sent informing him that his patient had died. And this of course is, uh, is important evidence because Cream is claiming that he didn't perform the abortion and was nowhere near. Um, you might be starting to think surely now third uh, murder that can be laid at his doorstep. Surely, surely things are going to work this time. And they largely, they don't largely because of this man. This is Alfred Trude. And Alfred Trude was a prominent defense attorney in 1880s uh, uh, Chicago, uh, known for his ability to uh, uh, get acquittals or uh, to spare uh, the clients convicted of murder from the gallows. And um, Cream has the money, thanks to his family, to hire the best, and Trude was one of the best. Um, but there's a lot of uh, allegations and very firm allegations that were in the press at the time that Trude's winning streak was less because of his ability as an advocate and more because of his habit of bribing jurors. Uh, there's no direct evidence that he did it in this case. Uh, Cream mounted a strong defense, which was that he was too skilled to have performed such a botched abortion. And the jury acquitted him, whether through corruption or just because the evidence wasn't strong enough. So he escapes that. And um, believe it or not, within the next uh, year, two more women, both connected to Cream, both patients of his, both seeking abortions, die or poisoned. He is uh, in the press talking about the cases, 
he starts his early blackmail schemes. He accuses druggists of messing up prescriptions and being responsible, but he never is, he's never charged or stands trial of either of those cases. I detail them in the book. Um, and again, just uh, missed opportunity after missed opportunity to catch him. And uh, uh, that's why I call, that's why the subtitle is The Hunt for a Victorian Era Serial Killer. That was what, that was my focus. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, recreate the crimes, but I was really, as much as anything, interested in how could he evade justice. And that got me into the questions of policing, privilege, the, uh, the stat status of women, and uh, primitive forensics of, of the time, really on the cusp of the, uh, uh, the modern era. Um, having escaped now, if anyone's, uh, I, I almost should have a, uh, I, I almost should have a numbers popping up, five murders, if you're keeping track. Then he picks up a client named Daniel Stott in this place, Belvedere, Illinois. You're probably aware it's uh, about an hour and a half northwest of Chicago. It's probably only an hour or so from Evanston and um, just by the Wisconsin border. And um, Daniel Stott sends his wife to uh, uh, Chicago on a regular basis to pick up medicine. He suffers from epilepsy and he thinks creams uh, medication and treatment have really helped him. Um, Stott's wife is about 24 years younger than him. This is Julia Stott, a drawing of her from a magazine. Uh, and um, at some point, uh, she and Cream have an affair. And by all accounts, are then in cahoots to murder her husband. Now, Julia Stott denies this and actually is charged, but testifies against Cream. But not to get too far ahead of myself, this, um, she gives the medicine to her husband, he dies. The coroner thinks it's natural causes because Daniel Stott had fits like this all the time. And only days later, Cream sends telegrams and letters, this is one of the telegrams, demanding the body be exhumed because he says, he believes it was strychnine poisoning. So here's, here's a killer who's gotten away with five murders, and perhaps this is arrogance in his part, actually inviting an investigation of a sixth murder. And sure enough, the bodies exhumed, they find strychnine, but they also find that Julia Stott's story is shaky, and she admits that cream had actually had the opportunity to tamper with the medicine. She claims to not be part of a conspiracy, agrees to testify against him, Cream's charged. He uh, stands trial here in the Boone County Courthouse, which um, looks very much like this uh, today. And a little aside, of course, I, I wanted the court file. And as I was doing my research, there hasn't been much written on Cream in decades. Um, that's why a lot of you probably never heard of him. He's, he's, he's obscure today, even though the sheer scale of his murders meant he was a sensation in the Victoria, Victorian era. But one thing I never saw in any of the early reports was any reference to the court file of this case in Boone County in 1881. So I, I, I thought, well, the, the detective and researcher in me says, you know, if you don't look, you'll never know if it's still there could be in an archive. But believe it or not, I, I called the courthouse and I was referred to uh, the semi-retired uh, former clerk. It took a couple of days for time zones and schedules to work, but I finally got her on the phone and I started with a long uh, introduction. It's not often people call up and say, I want to file from, you know, 140 years ago. And uh, when I told her it was cream, she said, oh yeah, uh, that's on my desk. <laughs> It turned out she was doing a history of the Boone County Courthouse and wanted to refer to, just wanted to have a reference to this infamous case that was tried in Boone County. So there's one for my students when I tell them that, you know, keep looking and, uh, and you'll find evidence. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever found 
uh, an obscure old document quite so fast as I did that time. Uh, Cream stands trial, is convicted, could have been sentenced to death, could have ended his career there. He sentenced to life in prison here in Joliet prison. And unfortunately, life in prison wasn't necessarily life in prison. Many convicted murderers were able to get their sentences shortened, uh, either an outright pardon after a number of years or uh, a commutation to shorten their sentence. And almost immediately, Cream started petitioning for this. And I show in the book that after almost 10 years, he ended up with some very powerful allies. Even the lawyer who turned state senator, who prosecuted him, supported his bid to get out of prison. And there were allegations at the time, and uh, I think I convincingly argue in the book that money changed hands, that there were kickbacks or bribes of some kind, because in less than 10 years, in 1891, uh, the governor of Illinois, uh, this is Joe Pfeiffer, um, uh, Private Joe, he was a Civil War veteran, very, very proud of the fact that he was surrounded by colonels and captains and majors and generals who'd gone into politics, but he was just an infantryman who'd, who'd made good. Pfeiffer uh, ends up commuting the sentence, and he does it quietly. These things were usually touted in the press, and I think that might be just more circumstantial evidence that it wasn't on the up and up. This is the document that ultimately freed Cream, and within a couple of months, this is at the end of July 1891, within a couple of months, he's in London, England, and he's killing again. So I didn't want to give you the whole story, but I wanted to give you some of, of the sense that this is very much a Chicago and Illinois story. Uh, again, if you're keeping track, four of 10 murders. Uh, happened in the state, and uh, uh, but for the ten years he spent in prison, we can only we can only guess how many more people he might have killed, uh, because for ten years he was unable to. So he killed ten people in the span of about five years uh, when he was free. Um, I just want to uh, I want to leave lots of time for questions, but I just want to. Um, leave you with a picture of probably the most bizarre and, and actually Halloween appropriate artifact of this case. I, I like to travel to the scene of the crime, if you will. I want to walk the streets of Lambeth, London to see where Cream lived, even if the buildings are gone, just to get the lay of the land. I wanted to go to Belvedere to pick up that file, but also I wanted to go because I wanted to see Daniel Stott's gravestone because uh, believe it or not, this is it. And it may be the only headstone in existence that actually indicts his killer. At the bottom, it says, poisoned by his wife and Dr. Cream. And uh, so this is in a place called Garden Prairie, a couple of miles east of, uh, of Belvedere. And that's where uh, Daniel Stott lived and died. And, uh, um, a, uh, a libel lawyer might say that Julia Stott uh, could take action. She wasn't actually uh, convicted of the crime, but it's, uh, it's I think, a fitting indictment of this uh, ghoulish monster. So um, that's, um, that's uh, some aspects of the story. I hope I've given you the flavor of it, and I hope, um, I hope you've got some good questions. So I'm going to stop sharing and Eden's come back and um, okay, let's talk. Thank you, Dean. Uh, I don't know, actually, I don't know whether to say I loved it or <laughs> I, I loved your presentation, but what a, what a crazy story. Um, so I, anyway, so <laughs> I, I do have a, I did love it, but wow. Um, so I have a couple of questions and then, uh, and, and I'm sure we'll get some more. Um, so, uh, you know, we often hear, or, you know, the, the term evil genius. And when you started talking, uh, 
that that came to my mind. Uh, was Dr. Cream an evil genius? Well, in some ways, yes. I mean, you, you don't evade. Uh, well, he didn't totally evade justice. I mean, he stood trial, was acquitted. He stood trial and was convicted and found his way out of prison, kept going. Uh, for most of, most of his crimes, um, he was able to escape to escape detection. Um, and one question that comes up is, well, was he insane? Was this the work of a madman? Mm -hmm. And there's so much madness, especially the letter writing and the, the, the demanding an exhumation, which gives the authorities in Belvedere, the, uh, the evidence they need to say, okay, we've got to look closer at this. And, and, and they, 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 bought, they uh, uncovered the idea that Cream was trying to sue, uh, sue or blackmail uh, a druggist and have them blamed and it backfired on them. None of that speaks of evil genius, I think. Uh, and he kept doing this. It seemed to be part of whatever mania drove him that, uh, he needed people to see how clever he thought he was. Um, uh, certainly skilled in the way that over time he became more efficient killer. He found better, new and better ways to package the strychnine, and, which is chilling. Um, and he was never, he, since he never pleaded insanity, he was never formally assessed. And um, I got to say that by the time he got to London and when the scale of his crimes were known, nobody was too eager to uh, uh, get into the niceties of, well, was he someone who was insane and should be spared? Uh, the, the sheer scale of his crimes meant that uh, um, the uh, ultimate pen penalty was probably going to be imposed on him. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, um, there's, um, certainly some chilling calculation. And, and I should end with that when you say what an evil genius. Again, you know, poison is, is by definition a premeditated murder. No one says, look, you know, I'm really mad at you. Hang on a minute, I'm going down to the drugstore to get some, I'm going to the hardware store to get some rat poison. Lead it to you. No, you know, it, 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 not to be trite, but I mean, it just to, to realize that a poisoner like this, this is one of the most, this is, is, is among the most calculating of killers. The mm -hmm. planning, the, the uh, arrange, the uh, uh, get, uh, sourcing the drug, figuring out how to get someone to take it. Strychnine is incredibly bitter. You can't convince someone to take it. You can't even put it in coffee. It'll be detected. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there was that aspect. And as well, another chilling aspect is that by all accounts that I saw, at times he had a fairly active practice. He didn't kill all his patients. Or some <laughs> some of them some, he treated. <laughs> some, yeah, and some he singled out to die, which again is, is, is chilling that, that uh, something within him, uh, I describe it as like, it's like he thought he was playing God, you know? He would decide who would live and who would die. Well, maybe, yeah, that um, I guess a doctor, you know, would be uh, well placed to, to begin to think that they might, or a Victorian doctor maybe would, would be well placed to think they might have that ability. So I had a question and then I'm gonna add to it. So the, first, the question was, can you talk a little about the legality of abortion? And then the, the question I'm gonna, at the time, obviously not today, no. um, and the question, and then what I'm gonna add is, um, it strikes me when you hear about uh, you know, I'm no expert, thankfully, on serial killers, but um, killers who prey on uh, women in the sex trade, um, ha they, they go to them. Now, was this almost entirely women who were coming to him for abortion? So that's my related question to, so he wasn't walking out and looking for these women. He was himself, they were coming to him for treatment. Is that correct? Let me start there, both. The mm -hmm. um, uh, four or five of the women in North America came to him for abortions. And then of course his, his um, well, I guess all of them, if you, include, if you include his bride. 
Mm. All of them came to him for an illegal abortion or he performed an illegal abortion or gave them drugs he said would cause him to miscarry, which was a common way of inducing an abortion or inducing a, inducing a mis miscarriage to, end, to terminate the pregnancy. So it was both. But in London, he specifically targeted sex workers. Okay. And you also, from some comments he made to others at times in his career, it became obvious that there was also an escalating loathing or hatred or, or um, targeting of women uh, throughout his life. I mean, it, by the end of it, he was calling the sex workers of Lambeth cattle who deserved to be killed. So this uh, gives an idea of the, of, the, uh, of the absolute depravity of the man. In terms of abortion, um, abortion was illegal. And that meant it, it was driven underground. It meant someone like uh, Cream was not advertising uh, that he was an abortionist and uh, could not do it officially. So uh, women, as you said, were coming to him for the procedure. Um, that said, there were a lot of things, a lot of um, um, patent medicines, you know, uh, were sold targeting women. And they would say things like they would, uh, you know, regular, uh, they would make the menstrual cycle more regular. And this was really code for it would induce a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked at a whole lot of um, historical studies of uh, of uh, both the law of abortion, but also the reality that uh, uh, at this time and, and earlier in the 19th century, um, the belief was uh, the fetus really didn't exist until many weeks into pregnancy. Again, a different attitude and based on the science of the time. So uh, this meant uh, women didn't feel uh, the same um, some of them didn't feel the same stigma or qualms about it. Mm -hmm. uh, quickening, it was called. When, you, when a woman could feel the fetus in the womb, at that point, an abortion was illegal. And it was kind of a great, in, in, every, in people's minds, the law said it was illegal at any point, but it was believed to be uh, acceptable, I guess, if I can put it mm -hmm. that way. Maybe more detail than you need. But Well, uh, it's interesting, you know, we never know... Um where our conversations are going to lead us, right? So it is really interesting. Um, I'm going to, I've got to look at my phone for a moment because this is where my questions are. So um, we have a, so uh, two related questions, which are what finally happened to uh, him or are you going to make us um, <laughs> by the book? And then um, related is how did he ultimately die? Well, um, spoiler alerts here. Am I going to make you buy? The, I'm not going to make you buy the book. <laughs> I, I might make you have to buy the book. Well, first you're, of all, you're going to intrigue us, but which we're all intrigued. Don't worry, Dean. You've done your job. <laughs> I do. I, this is scary. I know, and I don't mean to scare you on Halloween. He's 171 and he's still alive. Okay, um, he does come to grief. Scotland Yard does what nobody else did. And uh, that's why I can say with confidence uh, his rampage ends at 10. Um, the Scotland Yard investigation ultimately leads to a single murder charge, and he stands trial in the Old Bailey, uh, the famous Old Bailey courthouse. Actually, it's for anyone who's been to London, it's the predecessor of the one that's there now. And he, he was kept in Newgate Prison, which was on the same block. They were, these were two institutions knocked down for the, for the, the new Old Bailey, if you're, oh. if you're following me. And um, they only charged him with one murder because, for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, it gave them three other murders if he happened to be acquitted. They went with their strongest case. Oh. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, the Crown, the prosecution was able to bring in evidence of the other three murders, even though he wasn't charged. And the judge allowed this, and it was an incredibly important ruling. And it underlines a common law rule that exists throughout British law and in the States called similar fact evidence. In other words, you can be tried for one offense, 
but uncharged but related similar offenses can be brought in as evidence to corroborate. So in other words, Cream's on trial for one murder, but he's defending himself against four. Um, this uh, ruling is never appealed, but it does become law and it's used. And uh, there's a famous case of uh, uh, George Smith, you might have heard of in uh, during World War I around 1915, the Brides in the Baths murders. Uh, he married women and they, three women, all died in the bathtub soon after they were married. And uh, finally it was realized that he was doing this and he was making it look like they'd accidentally drowned. Um, and Cream's ruling helped convict him of the three murders. So um, I, I wanna leave a little mystery what ultimately happens to him. Okay, well. It's, uh, it's even interesting where he ends up as a, uh, as, as this uh, odious killer, because I wanted to track down where he's buried, but the, there's a little detective story there too. So let's just say that uh, uh, there is a, a very uh, uh, sensational trial in 1892. Uh, Cream is ably defended by one of the best lawyers in London. He's prosecuted by, by the attorney general. That's uh, something that did happen in prominent cases. and there was a real battle over the forensic evidence because the top toxicologist in uh, in England at the time uh, was the one who came to court to verify the presence of strychnine. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on some very, as you'll, you'll see, some very primitive tests. So I'm not, make, I'm not making you buy the book. I'm just doing my best to move you in that direction. Uh, yeah, I, well, like I said, Dean, you definitely have. I have two personal comments before we go on to a couple more questions. One is, I wrote it down because I wanted to remember to tell everyone, you know, Illinois, um, and particularly Cook County, um, where Joliet is not, um, have a real history of, um, of uh, well, I'll just say a bribery, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that you're bringing back this case where he almost certainly bribed somebody to have a, a high of high government official to have his um, to have his conviction uh, turn or commuted um, or or his sentence commuted uh, is amusing to us Illinoisians for sure. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, I'm wondering if anybody else noticed that Belvedere Courthouse building looked almost exactly like Old College at Northwestern. It must have been built about the same time. Um, oh, the, wow. the structure that you showed, the building, must have been, didn't you showed us the courthouse in Belvedere with a, yeah, yeah. that looks a lot like Old College um, and must have been built very, very close to the same time. Well, it would have. It was there in 1881. I was just trying to remember exactly when it was built because I, I know the history of it. I, um, but uh, it, it probably was 1860s, 1870s. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that would accord, but but that, that might have been a common. Uh, yeah, well, uh, my, uh, I mean, it was a style together. certainly popular. You know, with the, we're the Evanston History Center. We got to bring back some architecture and some Evanston history when we yeah. talk. About and I, I should say, I should say, look, um, uh, I, I won't do a spoiler look on my, uh, a spoiler on my, my book, but you know, you can check Wikipedia if you really, <laughs> if you really want to know what happened to Cream, if you're dying, you know, if you're dying to find out, and then you can read my book and he get the real story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's our next question. Uh, I can see that you emphasize the forensics of the case. But would you comment a bit on the psychology behind his motivation, especially because he impregnated his future wife and had an affair with Julia Stoat? So we, it's ironic, right? We can't tell, does he love women, hate women? Is, there, well, there's something there. No, the, the, it's a really good question. As I said, he was never formally assessed. Intriguingly, during the trial, the prosecution had four psychiatrists in the courtroom taking notes. Those notes did not survive. They were certain he was going to plead insanity. Mm -hmm. He didn't. In fact, Cream seems to think seemed to think he was going to walk free. 
Um, so it leaves me, and there was some, a lot of debate, was he mad? There's so much method in it. There's so much calculation. And as I said, at the end of the day, everybody was like, who cares if he's mad? <laughs> he's a monster, let's get rid of him. Um, but um, it left me to, to, to do something I'm not comfortable doing as a nonfiction writer. I mean, I do, I, I'm happy to speculate based on the evidence, as long as I'm clear to you, I'm speculating. But playing armchair psychologist, well, let me give you some, some, uh, some of the evidence. Rich, privileged background. So, you know, there's no evidence of abuse or hardship that would set him on a life of crime. Um, by the very nature that if he, there's money to send him to medical school, but this only gives him the, uh, uh, the tools. Uh, medicine at the time is ghoulish. Uh, one writer uh, uh, who, uh, one writer's described Victorian surgery as the butchering art. And it was very much that. Uh, surgeons weren't, weren't prided by, you know, their meticulousness. They were prided by if they could take out a tumor in 45 seconds, believe it or not, because any longer, and the patient would probably die on the operating table, although they would more than likely die of post-operative infection anyway. So it was a grisly uh, business. Did that set them over the edge? Well, you know, not every doctor <laughs> who graduated did this. His, um, his mother died and he was very devoted to his mother, but he was 19. So as you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm getting these intriguing signs of things that are known to maybe be in the psyche of a serial killer, but they're not quite working. And another was his um, narcissism. You saw that picture of him, the top hat, the, the diamond stick pin. I mean, he was uh, he uh, he was shunned in medical school. Nobody wants to associate with him because he he just rubbed people the wrong way. He always flaunted his jewelry and his fine clothes, all paid for by daddy. And was that part of it? I don't know. But I really wonder if that forced marriage to uh, to Flora Brooks, uh, the first headstone I showed you. Uh, I wonder if that somehow that um, set him on the path um, to uh, uh, taking it out on more women and just the way it escalated. It doesn't seem to have been one thing, but very early on, I mean, the pattern is there. I mean, uh, nine out of 10 victims are women. So, uh, you know, his, his misogyny, his, his hatred of women is obviously implicit. So I, I, did, I did try to delve into that, but uh, it's a lot of circumstantial evidence. And, uh, you know, at times you just wonder, is there just something, some switch was thrown in this brain of his? Because we're not just talking about he didn't like women. I mean, we're talking about burning hatred. And I do speculate in the book that, you know, he became a more efficient and lethal killer after Joliet and maybe 10 years of feeling hard done by, of, of uh, feeling that he was such a skilled murderer, but, and somehow been tripped up. And he blamed Julia Stott for turning evidence against him, always pleaded that he was innocent and she was guilty. Um, you know, all of that stewed for long enough that by the time he got out in 1891 and went to London, England, I mean, he got, I describe him as a killing machine. That's what he was. Mm -hmm. He was, he was a, a very efficient, lethal killer. I hope that, I didn't mean to dance around it a lot, but it, no, I, it's, really hard. it's so hard at this distance. And it's, uh, uh, and of course, it's also, uh, I'm also uh, caught up in the uh, very primitive uh, early uh, psychology of the time. So, and again, as I said, this was a new kind of monster to everyone. Uh, there wasn't a lot of experience with someone who was able to kill like this on such a mm -hmm. scale. How did you find Dr. Cream? Uh, do you mean like as a person or no? You mean, oh, <laughs> no. Um, well, um, this is where- Maybe just, how'd you stumble upon Dr. Cream? Well, maybe I'll... This is where everyone should be afraid. I obviously keep some bad company because I didn't know this guy and I knew his name. And, and I guess I'm Canadian. I knew about the Canadian connection. I knew about the Chicago connection and uh, my last book on part deception meant I, I know Chicago, I love Chicago. So um, it seemed to be 
uh, a, uh, a, a an interesting story. But well, what intrigued? So I, I guess what I'm saying is, even though he's obscure um, and hopefully less obscure thanks to the book, uh, and in the shadow of Jack the Ripper, and, and why is that? Even though he killed more people and more women than Jack the Ripper, because Jack the Ripper is the mystery. Nobody knows who mm. he is, and that is an afterlife. But what really intrigued me about Cream is I, I knew enough about his case to say, how did he do this? How could this happen? And I wanted to look at every case, every murder, every investigation, and they're all different. Mm -hmm. Different places, different characters, different laws at times. And um, uh, I just wanted to um, make that the focus of the story. Uh, I'm recreating the world he was in of recreating the crime and the investigations, but really hoping to to just show how this could happen and, and what it says about his times and the limitations of everything from forensic policing to the uh, uh, destructiveness of some of the Victorian attitudes. Any chance that this will be made into a movie? If there's anyone out there who's, who's interested, I, I, I certainly, um, I think it has all the elements. Uh, I do too. <laughs> uh, there was, there's been a little interest, but uh, uh, we'll see. But uh, I thought you were going to ask if there's a sequel, Cream 2, but uh, that's one of the <laughs> it's one of the problems of nonfiction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm afraid I can't change the ending of this one. But, uh, uh, no, I... I uh, I think it's an it's an incredible story, and uh, yeah, who knows? So, speaking of sequels, what's your next project? Well, um, when you said about how did I find Cream, I uh, I wasn't joking. After you spend a few years with somebody like this, I think I'm ready for a change, um, and I'm ready for a change in that um, Empire of Deception was about this charming con man. Mm -hmm. And yes, he victimized people, but people who should have known better than to invest in his Ponzi scheme. I've now found the story of a, a gentleman jewel thief in uh, Jazz Age, New York. And uh, the 20s, the Jazz Age is such a wonderful time. Uh, I call it uh, Catch Me If You Can meets The Great Gatsby. Oh. Uh, he charmed his way into uh, uh, parties with millionaires, uh, pretended to be you know, part of their social sphere while he was casing their summer homes and figuring out where they probably kept their jewels so he could come back later and rob them. So he was extremely enterprising. Um, I mean, think Cary Grant into Catch a Thief. So uh, he's got all this superficial, he's a con man in his own right, but uh, his target is, uh, is uh, stealing jewels. And he was just an incredibly uh, uh, skilled jewel thief and uh there's an incredible story about how he gets into the business and uh how uh how he ultimately comes to grief uh so that's my next book it's for algonquin again and uh, yeah, i'm thrilled it's just been announced that sounds really fun so you'll have to put us on your schedule for yeah. when it so um all right this being sort of a pre-halloween I'm wondering now, I know Dr. Cream's kind of the most awful, far more than the gentleman you just described or uh, Empire of Deception, but do you ever get a little spooked out by your, your research? As you say, keeping company with, hanging out with. Um, well, you know. uh, there was then, I said about, I, uh, you know, I want to go to the places uh, where the events happened. I knew I'd go to London simply because so much of the story. I mean, he was in London over the course of his career. He was in London for a couple of years. So uh, there were lots to see and lots of documentation. And lots of the world still existed. Um, and I like to do my own research. So I wanted to see this Scotland Yard file. And as I'm going through it, I came across these blackmail letters in his handwriting, which was incredibly distinctive. I mean, this is where Cream got someone else to write some of his blackmail letters, but he wrote some of them in his own handwriting, even though he signed other names, made him very, in fact, when Scotland Yard saw that, they knew they had the guy, that this would become part of the evidence. Um, well, I'm going through the file and I find these letters and it takes a little time for it to dawn on me. They're the original letters 
preserved all these years later. They were pasted on cardstock, you know, like the cardstock you'd get in a recipe card or uh, used to use them in uh, keep shirts square, that, that kind of uh, 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 just uh, thin cardboard pasted on all these years, they're crumbling at the corners, but I'm holding the actual letter that this creepy character uh, wrote. So, I mean, it, it is, it does take you aback or in other archives, when I find a document he signed, uh, the, the massive graduates of the Gill book and there's his signature, he handled this. So yeah, that's, um, <laughs> that makes for, I think, a creepy campfire or a Halloween story. And uh, like I said, I just never forgot that. And uh, it just, I describe it in the book when I talk about sources, but it's just another reason, I think, to, to go and do the research if you can. And pandemic makes it harder to sometimes travel, but uh, uh, you just don't know what you're gonna find. And, and that was a real surprise. Well, you know, you don't have to uh, sell anybody um, on this call about doing primary research because if they are historic, if they're if they're friends of the Evanston History Center, they're you know <laughs> you're singing our tune. So you you gave my commercial. I don't have to do it. So um, I guess I will will begin to wrap up. And maybe you could just tell us as a final question. Maybe you could tell us how did you get involved in true crime writing? It seems specialized you're obviously a professor so is it uh what came first and how did it become interesting to you well I, i'd like to say i get in on the ground floor because when i started as a journalist about well, i hate to say 30 to 35 years ago in the early 80s um uh true crime wasn't the kind of thing it is now um but surprisingly it's always been a thing we we think now there's this explosion of interest in true crime when I'm doing my research, 19th century newspapers ran verbatim accounts of trials. They were the court TV of their time. And they did this because the readers wanted it. So there was a sensational urge. In fact, the Chicago Tribune in 1880 said, um, there's nothing the average American reader once likes better than to read about uh, a bloody murder with all the gory trimmings. And this is in 1880. So, um, you know, it was ever that way. So um, maybe I got in on the, the, the new crowd before the crest of the new wave. But, it, but when I started as a journalist, my background had been in history. And uh, I ended up just by chance in true crime. I was sent to the courthouse one day. I'd never been in a courthouse, didn't know anything about the law. Mm -hmm. Not a barrier for a journalist, apparently. And started covering the court beat. And uh, the two came together, my fascination in, with history, and I would hear old cases, some of them sounded interesting, cited as precedents, started investigating old cases in Nova Scotia, and that snowballed. And, um, and I just think it's a, a really, it's a really good way to, in, to immerse readers in history, because I, I want stories that are more than just the crime, that say something about the times, be it the ex ex excesses and, and easy wealth and and uh, anything goes attitude of the jazz age or the stifling morality of, uh, of uh, Cream's time, you know, that say something to, to a modern reader. And what could be better way to immerse a reader in history than this kind of dramatic storyline when so much is at stake? Will justice be done? Will the guilty be punished? Will, uh, will this would-be victim escape? Um, it just it just lends itself to dramatic storytelling, and uh, so I'm hooked on it. So I, but I do, but I do feel it's uh, it's just an interesting way of presenting uh, history. So really, my uh, I call myself a true crime writer, but I'm really a, a writer of historical narrative that just seems to be going <laughs> into seems to focus on crime and justice. Uh. Well, the crime writer is shorter. <laughs> you know what they say: stick with what you're good at, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's the story, anyway. So I'm, I'm very lucky. I, I found something I'm really passionate about, and enjoy, and uh, I'm thankful to that editor who sent me to court that day over my protests. By the way, I didn't want to go. <laughs> uh, well, I'm glad I did. And as they say, the rest is history, right? <laughs> very good. Time. Well, Dean, I can't thank you enough for spending 
some of your evening with us, telling us all about Dr. Cream. Um, really a lot of fun before this program, Dean shared with us that he's been virtually traveling all over the country this week on Halloween, on the, I'll call it the Halloween tour. Um, so we're delighted that you can, could fit us in and talk to us what I don't, well, I'm going to say it anyway. What fun. <laughs> Perhaps we shouldn't say learning about a terribly murderous, horrible man, but still it was really, it was really fun. So thank you so much for being with us. You can call it a guilty. Thank you everyone for joining us and uh we will look forward to seeing you again soon take good care everybody good night thank you very much